Okay. Uh, okay. What, what I want to get, what I want to kind of want to get into now is, uh, uh, is to start building a foundation for understanding that uh, not only do we not know what's going to happen next, there's no way to know. Literally, there's no way to know. It doesn't seem the industry isn't set up that way. The industry is not set up that way to, to allow you to think that there's no way to know. But I'm going to prove to you that there isn't. There isn't a way to know. And the problem, and, and the thing is, when you when you really grasp why you can't know, then you won't think that there's some way to eliminate or reduce the risk. Because if if I go into a trade, if I, for example, if my if I do my analysis, I've gone, I stepped into this analytical process, and I come to a conclusion. My my analysis makes a prediction. I put on a trade. The trade works. Is it not going to be natural for me to think that the market is moving in my favor for the same reasons I put on the trade? For the for the basic screen-based trader like we are, okay? Just now I'm not talking professionals, I'm not talking fund managers or whatever. For the typical screen-based trader, that is almost never the case. There's almost never a relationship between the reason why you put on the trade and why the market went in your favor. And even if there was a relationship or correlation, there isn't any way for you to find out or prove it. Zero. That means that you don't ever know if your analysis is ever right. It'll be right in terms of, you'll know if it's right if it made the right prediction. You won't know if you had the right reasons for making the prediction. And if you don't know that you had the right reasons, then there's really nothing to be right or wrong about. Because one of the primary fears of trading is I'm afraid of being wrong. Hello? There's nothing to be wrong about because you don't ever know if you're ever right. <laughs> See, when you start understanding the nature of this business and the way it really works, you'll start shifting your perspective and say, you know what, there's nothing to be afraid of here. I can't prove if the reason why the market moved in my favor was the same reason why I put on the trade. And see, the problem is, as soon as I think that, as soon as I think that I know the reasons why the market moved in my favor, I will just naturally assume I can duplicate the process. It'll seem as if I'm in this winning trade. I know why I put the trade on. I'm assuming that the market's moving in my favor for that same reason, allowing me to think that I knew what was going to happen. And if I knew what was going to happen, then guess what? I've eliminated the risk. That is the most dangerous thought you can think as a trader is thinking you've eliminated the risk. The, the worst case scenario in thinking that we've eliminated the risk is a condition called mind freeze. Does everybody know what I mean by mind freeze? You, you think you know what's going to happen. You know, you've got three or four winning trades in a row. You know, and it's like, hey, I get, a ne I get the next signal. I got this, you know, I got the market by the balls. Okay, I'm, you know, I'm going to load up on this one. So instead of being, you know, uh, uh, you know, a hundred share trader, you move to a thousand shares, or five thousand shares, or ten thousand shares, or whatever. So, so as as you make this money management error, in other words, you are now stepping into the realm of trading far more than what your account size would would say is prudent. All the market has to do is go against you just a little bit, just a little bit. And because we're so, in other words, our level of commitment based on our our trade size. Would be, would be corresponding or correlated to how convinced we are that the market's going to go in our favor. So that just that little bit against us and we go into a state of mind freeze. In other words, our expectations of what's going to happen are so far away from the reality of the situation that our minds cannot process the experience appropriately. It shuts down. And as a result, we sit there and watch the, money, the market take our money away as the market moves against our position until like an innate sense of self-preservation kicks in. And for that level, it's different for everybody. That level of self-preservation, where our, where our minds kick in, that self-preservation mode, where it kicks in is going to be different for everybody. And we just like snap out of it and get out of the trade. Or, or like to say, we're losing one more dollar. Losing one more dollar is one degree more painful than admitting that we're wrong. Okay? In, other words, in other words, everyone has life experiences, memories that fall into a general category of what it means to be wrong. Like this is like, uh, like uh, these would be negatively charged beliefs. All the, all the ways that we can be wrong in our lives, that if we have experiences that tap us into this pain, we will experience it. 
all the beliefs and all the experiences that we have that go into our memories, just in a general category of what it means to lose, this is all negatively charged, painful, emotional energy. When the market, when the market is, when the market takes away, when it's more, when in other words, it is more painful to lose one more dollar than it is to admit that we're wrong is when we'll get out of that trade. This is not a good way to trade, people. <laughs> this is not gonna. This is not gonna assure you a success. Again, like I said a little earlier, we have to we have to trust ourselves. We we cannot be. Most people never recover. I, I, the traders that I've worked with, I would say that for the most part, most people never recover from it. They can if they really want to work at it. I'm not saying they can't recover from it. I'm saying that they don't want to do the work. They don't want to process. They don't want to go step into the process of what it requires to do the work to recover from a mind freeze experience. That, I'm not saying they don't, they, don't, they, don't, they don't keep on trading. But they're so damaged that, you know, because, because mostly when people experience a mind freeze experience without understanding the underlying dynamics of what caused it and what caused that pain, what do you, th what do you think they think their way out of it is? What do you think, how do you think they're going to compensate for it? More analysis. And then, of course, the more analysis, the more possibility of analysis paralysis. And the next thing you know, people spend years, you know, read, learning how to read the market. They become absolutely excellent analysts. They really do. But they can't put on trade. Because there's just too many variables to consider. And one of those variables that I might, you know, might not have, might, might have overlooked is the one that's going to, going to cause, me to be loose, cause me to lose. And so, therefore, I, cannot, I, can't, I can't get past the fear and put on trade. So... Uh, uh, we're, okay, so, so what we're going to do is, I, I, what I'm going to do is basically give you, give you some, uh, this is sort of a, 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 a little bit of an of evolution of how I came to the point where I recognized that, you know, we don't know what's going to happen next, and the risk always exists, and these are some of the things, like, you know, these experiences that, that initially happened in my life that I really kind of just, you know, that I took for granted, that, you know, I, I don't, you know, that I, you really don't need to know, and not only that, th there's no way to know. There's no, when you understand order flow, there's no way to know. Well, maybe I should give you order flow first. We'll see. Let's just try this. Okay, how do prices move? Prices move is a function of simply an imbalance between the buy and sell orders flowing into the pit or flowing into the exchange. It's that simple. When there's an imbalance between the number of buy orders flowing into the exchange and the number of sell orders that flow into exchange, then the exchange. So, for example, if uh, we have a 10, 11, 12, 9, 8, 7, and the last price is nine. What we have is we have people, we have traders who are bidding at eight and offering at ten. Now, now you you have to you really have to you have, there's a couple of things to take in consideration. One, there is a, as speculators. And interesting how we we know that we're speculating on price movement and yet do not think of ourselves as gambling. And yet we will define ourselves as speculators, but we're speculators who don't gamble. Okay, we're speculating, but we don't gamble. Okay. Anyway, there, what we have is a situation where we need price movement to make money. The price has to move for us to make money. It's that simple. Whereas, for example, there are there are several market participants who don't want the price to move. These are people who use the markets for legitimate commercial purposes. These are your hedgers. These are people who are naturally long or naturally short, whatever it is that they do for a living. So for example, if I'm a farmer and I'm planting my corn in the spring, anticipating harvesting it in the fall, I am, the moment, think about this, the moment that I decide, the moment I decide to plant my corn and how many acres I'm going to plant and what, my, and what I anticipate my, my yield to be for those acres, I am long corn. I am long the corn market. I didn't, all I did was decide to plant the corn and I become long the corn market. Why? Because whatever price fluctuation occurs between the moment I decide it and the moment I harvest my crop is going to determine how much money I get. So if I, if I get a, a million bushels or 100,000 bushels, whatever, the, whatever the, the price of corn is when I harvest it is, is, what, my, is what my income is going to be. So as a farmer, I'm thinking, okay, uh, my cost of, of, of production is X number of dollars per bushel. The price of corn, let's say the price of corn is at $7 a bushel right now in April. I don't know what it's going to be in October or November. I have the slightest idea what it's going to be. I'd like it to be $10 a bushel or $9 a bushel, but I don't know. And at, what did I say, $8 a bushel start out with? And at 7 let's say at 8 At $8 a bushel, you know what? And my cost of production is, uh, let's say, $5 a bushel. Would I be satisfied with a $3 a bushel profit? Yeah, I think I would. So what am, I, what am I going to do? I'm going to go into the futures market and sell the equivalent amount of futures contracts. I'm selling my crop in advance. So if I'm anticipating, let's say, 100,000 bushels and one futures contract is 5,000 bushels, 
what am I going to do? I'm going to sell 20 contracts. <coughs> if I think I'm going to get a million bushels, what am I going to do? I'm going to sell 200 contracts. And what I have done is I've locked in my price at $8 a bushel. If my price is $8 a bushel, I've locked it in at eight bucks. My cost of production is three, or my cost of production is five. That means I've locked in my profit at $3 a bushel, no matter what the price is in October. But in essence, it doesn't matter what the price is in October because I've got my price already. So the price can change as much as it wants. But what a lot of people, a lot of speculators, people who don't understand the markets don't realize is that when hedgers enter a market, in other words, what I'm going to show you is that it's an imbalance between the number of buy orders and sell orders that flow into the pit to determine whether the price moves up or down. And because, because we might only be trading, you know, five or ten mini S&Ps, or even as big traders, we might get into, you know, in terms of shares of stock, might get into a pretty, pretty, significant amount, pretty significant amount of shares. People don't realize is that there are commercial and institutional entities that can, that can put on orders, massive orders, that can affect the price, affect the imbalance between the buys and the number of sales coming into the pit, and think that they're taking risk, that they can't, nobody would do that because it's too risky to do it. Wrong. It's not risky. They're eliminating the risk. They're putting in orders that can have a huge impact on the price, and they're eliminating the risk because they're already naturally long or short. <coughs> you guys, you sort of with me on this? So, for example, if I got a if I got an a, a electric motor manufacturer, and my sales manager comes back with a with a huge order that you know he sold uh, these huge generators that are you know you know five hundred thousand dollars a piece or whatever, and he went over to some foreign country and sold ten of them or something. The moment he signed the contract, the moment he got the purchase order. Uh, whatever the amount, the amount of pounds that it takes to make these gen of copper that it takes to make these orders, they are short copper unless they already have it in their inventory. Chances are they don't have it in their inventory because let's say they're running at high capacity and what they have in their inventory is just enough to make whoop, whoop, the orders that they already have. And because they're not even going to start making the orders for six months from now or whatever, it's like they don't want to acquire the actual physical inventory of all that copper. What are they going to do? They're going to go into the futures market and buy the equivalent number of copper contracts that they need to lock in the price of copper when they need it to use it so that they can, so that they can guarantee their profit margin. That might be a huge order. Now, if I just happen to be trading off a of moving average, my technical indicator off a of moving average on, you know, in, the, in copper, at the time that that order hits the pit or hits the exchange, you know, if I'm, a, if I'm on the, if, 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 uh, um, if, if I'm on the long side, if my moving average just shows me, you know, about two or three minutes before their order, huge order, hits the exchange, I'm going to find myself in a winning trade. Did my reason for putting on that trade have anything to do with why the market went up? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. It's just what I call like a positive synchronicity. A planned synchronicity with the order flow. Well, let's get into the order flow, okay? So, for example, what does it take? If the last price, so, so here, I just wanted to make this distinction between speculators and hedgers. Hedgers, when they put an order in the market, they don't want to make the price move. In other words, if I'm this, this, this generator, this manufacturer of generators, and, I'm, and I need to lock in the price of copper, to lock in my profit margin, when I put my hundreds of copper orders in the market, I don't want to force, I don't want there to create such an imbalance in, in, the, in the order flow to cause the price of copper to go up. Because, because I'm increasing my average price. What I want to do is do it in a way that doesn't create price movement so that I maintain, you know, my, I maintain my average price or I maintain a good average price. Because what happens is this, is that what you have is that for us as speculators to make money, there's only, one, there's only two ways to make money. That's it. Everyone's trying to do the same thing. Everyone has to buy low and sell high or sell high and buy low. There's no other way to do it. There's absolutely no other way to do it. And as speculators, screen-based, typical screen-based speculators, we don't have the, uh, let's say in many cases, or in any case really, not many, uh, where we don't have the financial or the psychological resources to actually move the price ourselves. Whereas you have to understand that there are plenty of traders out there who do. There are a lot of hedge fund managers and big traders who can, under, under a lot of different circumstances, actually create price movement purposefully. They purposefully look for situations with what I call like the herd masters. Okay, where they're looking for they're looking for patterns, they're looking for, for chart patterns where they know that a lot of uh, what they call weak weak longs. You've heard these words, weak longs and weak shorts have gone into the market, and what they want to do is they want to force the weak longs out so they can they can they can buy they can buy they can buy, get into their position at a lower price, or they want to force the weak uh, weak shorts out so they can they can sell at a higher price. And they'll look at chart patterns where they know that spec the typical speculator has gone into the market. They'll hit the they'll hit the market with huge orders, force the price lower or higher cause the typical speculator to panic because 
uh, cause them to panic, which, which creates further movement in the direction against the speculator, but what they need is inventory. I'll explain how this works, okay? So for example, buy low, sell high, sell high, buy low. If the last price was nine, how does it get to 10? Yeah, more buy. In other words, in other words, look at it this way. If you look at it from the exchange perspective, before there are electronic, chain, electronic exchanges, exchanges you, you have executable orders. And for every buy order, there has to be a sell order, or you can't execute a trade. On an electronic exchange, it's the same way. There has to be somebody on the other side of your trade. Whether it's a computer program that was, you know, that was designed by a major brokerage firm like Goldman Sachs or whatever, or an actual individual, it doesn't make any difference. There is somebody on the other side of your trade. In every circumstance, in every single circumstance, which means that if, if you, you buy at 9 and the price goes to 10 or 11, who's ever on the other side of your trade is losing money. The money that you're gaining is the money that's coming directly out of their account to the clearing firm into your account. And when the market goes against us, the money that's flowing out of our account, going into the clearing firm, and going directly into the account is on the other side of, is on the, other side of the trade. So what this means is that if the last price was 9, how it gets to 10 is that there were no executable. In other words, I have a certain number of buy orders flowing into the pit at 10. There has to be, a, there has to be an executable sell order to match up with every buy order. If you're not getting this, let me know. There has to be an executable sell order to match up with every buy order for the price to go anywhere. If there is an even amount of buys flowing into the exchange at, at, this, at any particular moment with, with the with number of sells as there are buys, the price will go nowhere. Are you with me on this? If there's an even number of buys and an even number of sells, executable buys and sells at this price, the price goes nowhere. It doesn't go up to 10 until there aren't enough sell orders at nine to fill the number of buy orders for the people who want to buy, or the number of, number of contracts or shares or whatever available on the buy side. And then the electronic exchange, what it'll do is it'll move the price up to 10 to find sell orders, to find executable sell orders. And if there aren't enough executable sell orders to match the buy inventory flowing into the pit, then it'll move it up to 11. When we're dealing with physical exchanges, people actually did this. In other words, what you had are actual traders in the, floor, on the, in the exchange, in the pits, or whatever, who would actually bid the price up. In other words, if they couldn't find any other traders in the pit who, who, who they could execute a trade at 9 at, they'd bid it up to 10 or bid it up to 11 to find someone who would, someone who would sell. Because the whole idea is sell high, buy low, buy low, sell high. So the higher the price goes, the, the theory would be the more attractive it would be for someone to come into the pit and take the other side of my trade. Are you guys with me on this? So what it all boils down to is that price movement is simply an imbalance between the number of buys and number of sells flowing into the exchange. That's it. That is it. But it has major implications. For example, when I, uh, you know, I started trading in 1978, and I was working in the uh, commercial casualty uh, business. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was managing a commercial casualty agency just before I moved. Then, then I mean, just pretty much just before I moved to Chicago, I uh, signed a three-year contract with this agency for three hundred sixty thousand dollars. One hundred thousand the first year, and one twenty in the second, and hundred and, and one hundred and forty in the third. So I mean, I was kind of financially, I was, I was, you know, I was doing good, especially I was in my early thirties, and. Uh, uh, but shortly thereafter, something happened. I was also, I also didn't like managing. I, I didn't really like being in the insurance business. And I certainly didn't, I thought I liked management. I did not like management at all. I was a horrible manager. Yeah, but yeah, anyway, just, just not something, just not something my, my brain was into. But, but in any case, um, something happened to me where, where I felt compelled to move to Chicago. Because I was, I got a, I called from, a, from like a Shearson broker in the building we were in. And, uh, I opened up a commodities account and started trading gold and silver right off the bat. And uh, lost, you know, my first couple of stakes, you know, whatever. The, I think I started out with a ten thousand dollar account, lost that. You know, did another five or six thousand dollars, lost that. Changed my broker, went to a different broker at Shearson, thinking that you know, he he would do a better job. Had no idea. Remember, this is in 1978, 1979. What we understand about the markets and what's available to us were virtually today were non-existent back then. We didn't even have computers. Okay, we didn't even have personal computers. The only way to even know what was going on was to call your broker 10 times a day or whatever. And also, we didn't have instant execution. You know, what you had is a situation where you want to execute a trade. You've got to call your broker. You've got to dial the phone. He has to answer the phone. If he's on the other line with another customer, you had to wait. And then once, once he answered the phone, of course, he had to uh, write out a ticket. The ticket had to be wired down to the exchange. Once it got to the exchange, it got to the uh, phone clerk at the exchange. The phone clerk wrote out another ticket and gave it to a runner. The runner then gave it to the appropriate uh, 
a broker executing trades for that particular firm in the pit, and then and then the broker would, do, based on supposedly open outcry, actually you know say, hey, I've got I've got five to buy or five to sell at this price, and then if someone else, whatever, another maybe another brokerage firm or just a local, some guy trading for his own account standing in the pit, hit the order, hit the bid or the offer, whatever the price was, and then the uh, then the, the floor broker would would uh, you know record the trade, uh, get it give it back to the runner, the runner would then go back to the phone clerk, the phone clerk would go and call up uh, or wire it back to the back to the brokerage house, and then the broker had to get back to you with a fill. Okay. <laughs> And all this costs an average with the big firms like Merrill Lynch and Hutton and Shearson, like 100, 100, between 130 and $140 a round term. One contract, one contract trade between 100, 130 and 140 bucks. Now, I can't tell you how many times I put in an order later on. I mean, just, but just, just to give you an example, if I put in an order, you know, to buy silver at, at uh, you know, nine bucks an ounce or whatever, okay, that, you know, I'm buying at nine dollars an ounce and, and the market comes down and hits my price, but I'm not guaranteed to fill unless it goes one tick through my price. So if it hits my price and goes back up, I don't even know if I'm in a trade. My broker doesn't even know if I'm in a trade if the floor broker hasn't gotten back to him yet. If the floor broker is busy, it might take 20 minutes, half an hour. If, if it's what the, the exchange classified as a fast market, he wasn't even obligated to get back to me until maybe an hour. I don't remember what it was. So I could be in a winning trade and not know it. I could be wanting to take my profits and not even know if I'm in a winning trade. If I go ahead and just assume that I got filled and, you know, and, and, and sold, I could end up being net short. You know, the market's going up and not even know it. You know, I mean, I could end up being not, net short and not know it. The old timers with the Tony, you know what I'm talking about, right? Well, you knew you were going to get your book a while, but here's where my stocking. You get your stocking, stocking, please. This was a rough way to trade, people. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This was a rough way to trade because not only that, even check out where we didn't have we didn't have price available. We didn't have any prices available. We had to call our broker, you know, 20 times a day. Where's it now? Where's it now? Where's it now? Basically, what you did was trade off a daily bar chart from the Wall Street Journal. In other words, you get the Wall Street Journal in the morning and you do your, go ahead, Tony. And, and you have a commodity perspective. Yes, a commodity perspective, right. right. It was a book. It was a book. Yes. And it, it gave you like three or four months of, of bars, daily bars, and it gave you some room on, on the right there to, to add your own bars in. Yes. Yeah. And 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 you remember, <laughs> 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 so yeah, it was. It, it's like you, you know, there's things that you learn that, that you know you sort of take for granted about about the way you developed as a result of that. But anyway, this this was really a tough way to trade. And so so what happened? What happened with me? So you do understand the concept that it's simply an imbalance in order flow, right? Everybody, everybody with me on this? If there's more buy orders, sell, so why did the market? Why did the market go up today? More buy orders and sell orders. Why did the market go down today? More sell orders and buy orders. Now, the reason why there were more buy orders and sell orders? Oh, how do we know why? In other words, every one of us in our room, in the room, has a reason. Everybody contributes to. Everyone contributes to the order flow, which means that everyone contributes to the up and the down ticks. Everyone, every order contributes to the up and the down ticks. So why did the market tick up? Well, you, basically the reasons exist in the minds of everyone who put on a trade that contributed to the imbalance between the buys and the sells in that moment. And since the exchange, since one, when we put a buy or a sell order in, since you are not required to attach your reason of putting, <laughs> you are not required to attach your reason for doing it. What? That's how the one? Oh, oh yeah, make every give the reason. Yeah, right. Yeah. Now, since, since we are not required to attach our reasons, and neither is anybody else, then we don't know why other people are doing it. And what's interesting is that as typical screen-based traders, we are strictly dependent on what other traders do after we get into a trade. Since we are not, we don't have the financial or emotional resources to be able to move the market ourselves. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. Since we do not have these resources, then we are strictly dependent on what other traders decide to do after we get into a trade. And the reality is, we don't have the slightest idea why, what they're going to do, or why they're going to do it. In other words, orders are going to flow into the exchange after we get into a position. We don't know what the, what the volume between, we don't know what the imbalance is going to be. In other words, there could be a huge order that hits the market in our favor, but there happens to be enough 
a huge buy order. We just got in. There's a huge buy order that, that hits the market a few minutes after we get into a trade. But there's enough sell order inventory in that moment, in that moment, to absorb all that, all that buy volume. Price goes nowhere. Five minutes later, that buy order could create a panic. And the market could shoot right up like this. Why did it happen? Because for whatever reason, whoever put the mortar in, however many traders did it, and for whatever reason they do it, we'll never know unless we have a way, unless the exchange, the reality is, the exchange, if the exchange gave us, uh, 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 gave us the, uh, the names and you know, the accounts and the names of all the people who contributed to the order flow in any given moment so that we could go ask these people why they put their orders in the market, then we would know why the price went up or why the price went down. Then we would know the real reasons. Everything else that you hear or read is basically shit that people are making up, and I'm not kidding. <laughs> and I'm really serious about that. It's, people, it's stuff that people are making up because they don't know. People don't get on TV or write articles and do it in a way where they don't sound like they know what they're doing, or are not gonna, or are not gonna do it in a way where, where they don't sound intelligent or that, that, that they know what they're talking about. So even if they don't come right out and say directly, this is why or that's why, they're implying that they know. Which gives us the idea that somehow or another it can be known. And there are, there are exceptions. Because if you do know large fund managers and, and traders who can move the market and put in, and they do put in huge orders, and you happen to know that this, these huge orders hit, hit the exchange, and there wasn't enough inventory on the other side to, uh, to absorb those orders, and that's the reason why the market went up. If, if you know that directly, then you know why it happened. And certainly the guys that, or the people that put those orders in, they know why it happened because they're the ones who did it. For the typical screen-based trader, this information is, all, for all intents and purposes, unknowable. So the implications are that regardless of how sophisticated your analysis is, regardless of how good you think it is, it isn't telling you the reasons why. Even if, for example, let's say we're trading a support and resistance pattern, okay, or we're trading, you know, uh, 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 we're trading a retracement, okay. So what we have here, and I put and I put a buy order in right here, and the market shoots up. Is it possible that the reason why other traders came into the market and created an imbalance in the order flow is because they happen to put orders right in there too? Yeah, it's very possible. It may even be likely. Is there any way that I know that? No, I don't know, do I? It's unknowable to me. And if you think that what I'm saying isn't correct, all you've got to do is challenge somebody. Every time you hear somebody say, the life price went up because of this. Other than an imbalance in buy and sell orders, every time you hear somebody give you a reason, say, prove it. Prove how you know that. Where's the information that you have access to that tells you that that's the actual reason why? Tweet the people on CNBC. Tell them to prove it. <laughs> say, prove it. I guarantee you they'll shut up. Because they can't. <laughs>